Bachani. Jyoti Bachani, uh, I think, graduated from India and went to USA. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and I'll be sharing uh, some of the uh, very, very uh, great, uh, you can say, credentials of uh, Dr. Bachani. But uh, before all that, I would like to share that uh, we all know, many of us know Jyoti as a passionate committed for the humanistic management as a, as a teacher and as a facilitator across the world. So, uh, and that's how she has been, uh, is a co-founder of the IHMA, the International Humanistic Management Association in USA. And she is also the inspiration and motivation to start the India chapter. I hope some of you after this session will be more active and uh, involved in the India chapter activities as well. Uh, Jyoti, I think I just uh, had a glimpse of your introductory slide and that is very well prepared. So when I am giving some of the credentials, it is nice to have that in front of the audience. Uh, as I told you, she is the uh, 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 co-founder of IHMA. Uh, I have had opportunity of meeting with Jyoti in the Academy of Management meeting about six, seven years ago. Before that, she visited India as a scholar, as a Fulbright scholar, and she stayed at MDI, Management Development Institute, Gurgaon, uh, did very interesting work in the developmental field, uh, how some of the developmental organizations are bringing about positive change in the society. Uh, so some of the excellent case studies are written by Jyoti on the uh, initiatives uh, uh, being taken up in India and across the world, but there are a lot of good case studies being written by, by her. She is the PhD scholar of none other than late Professor Sumantra Ghoshal. Sumantra, Professor Sumantra Ghoshal is one of the most well-known uh, management academic and thinker. Uh, Indian of the Indian origin in the modern time. And, uh, she has the edu uh, education in engineering and science from Stanford. And uh, uh, currently she's a faculty member in the St. Mary's College in California. So it is really, uh, 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 it's, it's wonderful that uh, Jyoti is available and she's offering this session. We all are looking forward to it. Thank you, Ashish, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, everybody, for being here and giving me this opportunity to share my work with you. It's a pleasure. I wish um, I had a chance to know how many of you are PhD students, how many of you are academics, how many of you are practitioners, if there is a way to give me an indicator of that. Um, that way I can focus the talk on the needs of the audience. So if you're a PhD student in the participant window, there's an opportunity to say yes. Or maybe uh, one way is you can uh, stop sharing the screen and so that everybody can have a gallery view. And for the PhD, so those who are the PhD student, you go to the reaction uh, icon and uh, do like this. So we will come to know that you are a PhD student. Like this. Or a student, okay. just any student. Yeah. If you're a student, yeah. give me a thumbs if up. You're a student, PhD student or a MBA student. Okay, excellent. Wow, so many young scholars. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you Thanks very much. And similarly, uh, now Jyoti, you can ask about the. So, um, if you are uh, an instructor, give me a thumbs up if you're an instructor. Thank you. Okay, I think that gives me uh, enough information. 
I will assume the rest of you are practitioners or interested in management for whatever reason and interested in use of the arts. And if there are artists in the room, please forgive me for not being an artist and using a very, very broad definition of art where everything from movies to the culinary arts, um, including any creative activity into that large umbrella that I use. This is the agenda I've set for the hour that we have together. I hope to have a chance for open Q&A at the end. I will quickly mention what humanistic management is. I assume many of you already know because you have found your way to this talk. And then I'll talk about why I am the flag bearer for using the arts to humanize management. Humanistic management, as you know, is a big tent with multiple poles with many people doing many different things. Um, I happen to be the flag bearer for using the arts for humanizing management. Um, the short and quick answer to why I'm passionate about it is because I think we need creative solutions. I think a lot of our theories in management are focused on tapping into our intellect but not enough taps into our imaginative capabilities and into our intuition. And management in my experience, because I'm a strategy professor, is a very nuanced thing with paradoxes, with complexities, and the dry language of words and logical rational theories sometimes doesn't capture those paradoxes enough. So it art and non-verbal ways of expressing ourselves and connecting give us a much richer language. So that's in short, you know, my position on what I profess and why I use the arts. My particular um, form of arts that I used to pursue as a hobby until five years ago, when I went from bringing it from my leisure time activity to merging it with my professional work, are improv theater games, poetry, which I've read all my life, and some dabbling with visual arts. So I'll give you some experiential taste or trailers and some stories about how I've used that. So that's the agenda and um, what we will spend our time together on this evening. Uh, humanistic management was started by Michael Pearson, who we are fortunate to have in the room with us. Before starting the International Humanistic Management Association, Michael was also the founder of the Humanistic Management Network. Both of those organizations continue to thrive and grow. And um, he's the most passionate advocate and has spread this thing globally uh, by finding the best people who are doing the best work to reinvent management and creating new paradigms that are sustainable, that are humane. And the two cornerstones of humanistic management are every human being deserves to be treated with dignity. Every human being. Respect you have to earn, but dignity you always have. And the second cornerstone is social well being. Organizing is an active verb, and we humans organize because we want to create social well being. Organizations should be serving humans rather than humans ending up as human resources for organizations. So it's trying to take control back um, in. Management has become too dominated by the economic rationalistic thinking. So if we have time at the end, and if enough of you have not seen it, I will show you a short three minute video introduction to it. Um, but um, Michael's in the room and those are the two big things that unite all of us that work under that big tent that we care about human dignity and social well-being. In, by intention, it's designed to be a pluralistic approach. Many of my colleagues work in many different ways towards those two goals. Ashish is here, Ben is here. Um, Ben's work is uh, on bringing indigenous wisdom. He's also very concerned about inequality in the Filipino society. 
Uh, she studies um, the impact of yoga and embodied wisdom and different philosophical traditions. So that management literature is not dominated by the Western thinking, but also includes Indian, much more ancient Indian philosophical traditions. Um, there are people studying conscious capitalism, authentic leadership, post-capitalistic system, how to give voice to values. So as you can see, there's a very large variety of ways of being involved with the humanistic management movement. And there are chapters in many, many different companies. Ben happens to lead the Philippines chapter. Professor Ashish Pandey leads the Indian chapter along with Professor Vasanti Srinivasan from IIM Bangalore and Professor Dharm Bhavuk from University of Hawaii. We have chapters in US and I'm involved with the US chapter, Mexico, Germany, Italy, many, many different countries. So it's truly a very global organizing effort that is continuously growing. And unlike a lot of other organizations where they appear big on the internet because they promote themselves really well, but they don't have as much substance, my experience with the International Humanistic Management Association is the opposite. We're doing a lot more. We are all doers and practice oriented. We don't have time to update the website and tell the world about it. So the more people get involved, the more work happens, but it doesn't get as much visibility. It's a growing global community. It is interdisciplinary by design and it's very, very practice oriented because we see the need for this work to be very, very urgent, especially now with the pandemic, it has become even more urgent. So we're all very um, quickly seeing a shift from being, uh, you know, people who were seen as missionaries doing something that we were passionate about as people who have a valid alternative model for a sustainable world that we need. So if any of this excites you, I'll at the end of the presentation mention different ways of getting involved, how you can be seen, your voices heard and your work get global recognition as part of joining the effort we are doing. More than a decade ago, um, Michael um, with the Humanistic Management Network was handing out awards to people who were doing good work and Professor Anil Gupta from India, from IIM Ahmedabad was one of the first recipients of the Humanistic Management Award. And if you don't know his work, you should definitely look him up. These are some of the many organizations that he is associated with and has the President's Award for Grassroots Innovation. Um, and every year holds an exhibition at the Presidential Palace in Delhi so uh, wonderful work that has been done. And he's been associated with the Humanistic Management Network for over a decade from India, even though the chapter formally launched this year. And there are many other projects that I'll mention again towards the end of different ways of getting involved. Let me get to, um, and one final thing on that. Each word that we use, um, for example, I said, Dignity is very important. All of us believe in human dignity. What does that mean? So there is a whole body of literature associated with that. Professor Donna Hicks at Harvard has defined dignity with a 10 point framework and there's books written about it. She worked with the Middle East peace process using the dignity framework for several years. So it's very rich and deep. So when you get involved, it's not just words that we use, it's like drawing in very deep literary uh, academic traditions for each aspect of what we talk about. Um, so why do I choose to use the arts? And um, I have no arts training. I trained as a physicist and an engineer. Um, as I already confessed, art was mostly a leisure activity. But um, over time, as I felt that management theories were too dry and not nuanced enough, I found that engaging with the art allows for this more nuanced language and allows for creative processes with imagination and intuition 
to come into play. And that was one of the motivating factors. And the best way for me to do that, rather than take my word for it, to demonstrate it with some sort of experiential things. Um, so let me take you through that. If I showed you that image and played the music or credits that go with it, my guess is most of you in the room will be able to recognize that and be able to say, oh, that's 007, James Bond. And that's the power of art, that it can unify people across different parts of the world and reach every body, regardless of your education level, your economic standing. Um, so that's how powerful it is. I assume most of you do not live in the wild west, but that image will immediately be bringing the name cowboy to your conscious awareness. Um, and that's sort of the visual language. Um, if I put this image up, most of you will know what this image is. So everything from sort of low brow art of popular cinema, popular music to high brow opera, classical music, um, Renaissance paintings and, um, you know, everything's included very generally in what I'm talking about, because as I said, I'm working from the amateur level. Most of my life was spent as a consumer of art, but now it sparks my creativity. And that's why when we need to create new paradigms, it's really, really powerful and useful to do that. Those of you who have signed in from India will probably look at these images and recognize that this is a particular style of painting popular in India called the miniature painting. And this particular image is very common from an area called Kishangarh, and it's called Banithani. Um, so anybody with interest in painting in India will recognize that as the equivalent of what Mona Lisa would be for the world. So Banithani would be the Mona Lisa equivalent for India. Here's another image. Now that you have seen the previous two and you look at this, what do you think about that? What comes mm -hmm. to your mind? If you can put in the chat window a few words your impressions of it, the thought, the feeling, the reaction, anything that comes to your mind as you look at this image. If you can share that in the chat window. So one of my co-hosts will help me facilitate it as we go forward, but I'm assuming that we have some reactions to this. I personally found this image to be uh, very close to my heart. Um, it hangs in my living room as a framed image because for me, it combines my two aspects of having grown up in India and having lived in Europe and America and become very westernized. Uh, but still being deeply rooted in my family traditions uh, with the Indian part of it. And this hybridization represents to me exactly what my experience of the world is, which is a rare experience. Um, some people might find this ugly. Some people might find this offensive that, wow, well, how dare some village artist in Kishinger copy the masterpiece that Leonardo da Vinci created um, and why is Mona Lisa dressed in India, Indian clothing or the stylized elements of it may not be, you know, it's not accurate representation, but it's sort of idealized from a different tradition. But for me, this was an image that spoke to me and I liked it, so I kept it. So art has this power of provoking us to surface our assumptions and also soothing us to say we belong. It expresses where I belong. It doesn't express where a lot of other people 
may or may not belong and it would provoke them differently. Um, and then we can have a dialogue or our own understanding self-reflection about things like that. So that's one sort of exercise. Let me take you through another exercise. I'm gonna scroll very quickly through eight images. They're numbered one through eight. What I want you to do, so here's the number, number one. As you look at the eight images, pick the one that resonates with you. And then I'm going to ask you at the end of seeing all eight images to put in the chat window the number of the image and one or two words about it as to why you picked it, what it means to you, or what your reaction was, whatever it evokes in you. So just keep track of the number and your reaction to it, and then be ready to put that in the chat window. Okay, go for it. With 49 participants, I only see 36 chat messages, including the previous one. So go ahead and participate. You're not going to be judged on this. There is no quiz at the end of it. There's no right or wrong answer. Just a way to get to know yourself. Thank you for participating. So this is one of the ways for those of you who are instructors in the room that I use it in the classroom. I will just bring a bunch of images. Um, these happen to be displayed in my class. Um, you can also buy ready-made images from the Center for Creative Leadership it's called Visual Explorer, but you can also bring your own and um, ask students to pick an image and then react to it. So there are different images that evoke different feelings. It can be used as an icebreaker activity. It can be used as a check-in at the beginning of the class. We have four hour long classes in our executive MBA program. So a few minutes spent on this activity is perfectly fine. And what I found after I tried it the first time as an experiment was that it was very well appreciated. The students came back and said to me, I had no idea this is how I was feeling. But being able to just pick an image and then to think about it reveals something to me about myself. If you had asked me, how am I doing? I would have said, fine. But in given a choice between a bunch of different images, when I picked one and I pick a different one on a different class day, I know how my day has gone. And that was really powerful. So I got encouraged by that kind of feedback to continue to do those exercises where students stand around, talk about it, um, about their day or about getting to know each other in various ways. So it's a visual explorer way of connecting with people. And it's very different from the typical way we 
have icebreakers where at least when I've traveled to a lot of places, it's usually where do you work? Where do you study? The usual introduction that you got about me, which is very much tying me into a role of a professor associated with a particular location rather than who I am as a human being and what matters the most to me, which is a very different connection that can happen possibly through using the arts. And once you saw the Mona Lisa as Bunny Tani, you knew a little bit more about me as a human being than the introduction that was offered at the beginning of the seminar. So you see the difference? Um, and even in this short exercise, in class, students get attached to the images. They will often want to take them home or take a picture of it and make it the home screen on their cell phone for the week as a theme. At the end of the class, sometimes if it's the last class, they will take it home as um, to use as a bookmark or you know display it in their car dashboard so that it is a reminder of the time together. So art has a way of connecting us. And I found that in COVID times, because all our classes have gone online, number of us miss being on campus. We have a 400 acre beautiful campus. And so one way to bring spirit into the Zoom room was an exercise I tried, but I told my students, just go to the campus website and find an image that you like and bring it back and share it. So we did a few minutes of that exercise. So this is the main chapel on our campus. Somebody brought an image of the inside of the chapel. Somebody took a closer image of the chapel rather than from the quad with the distance and the trees. Um, somebody brought the inside of the chapel without people in it. So even though it's just the same chapel, the perspective that you bring is uniquely yours. And that reveals something about the person, what state they're in, what's their way of looking at things, what matters to them. So this exercise worked on Zoom to not just bring the spirit of campus, but also the spirit of the person who made the framing choice of what they wanted to bring and what they cherished. So I've just got these random images in between, which some of you will recognize, especially if you're from India. Another way that I've used art is to ask my students to create it. And that's a very intimidating activity. If you ask a grown up student in a business school to create something, they, they will immediately say, oh, I'm not an artist, I can't draw, I can't do this. If I ask the same question in a kindergarten class with five-year-olds to say, you know, would you draw, how many of you can draw? 100% of the hands go up. In fact, there is a joke about in an art class, a girl was drawing and the teacher she was the last one to finish the exercise and was still drawing. And the teacher said to her, what are you making? He says, I'm drawing God. And the teacher said, well, nobody really knows what God is like. And the girl confidently said, they will when I'm done with my painting. So that level of confidence we all had at some stage, but somewhere along our schooling, that was taken away from us. So we can recreate it and claim our creative selves. If you were in an art school, the formal definition of drawing is to make a mark on a piece of paper. Instead of saying draw, if I told you make a mark on a piece of paper, all of you would be willing to do that. So students who are intimidated originally end up getting into the exercise and there's literally pin drop silence in the room. Something about playing with colors and art, it absorbs you and it brings this contemplative, meditative, one with yourself and your creative flow state coming through. That's been amazing. And, you know, um, these athletic students who have never sat down to do a contemplative activity and would run from it if I was to say, let's meditate automatically end up 
in that state and enjoying it and supporting each other. So the images that you saw one through eight were drawn by my students in their class. And if I'm slightly less harsh rather than drawing, I can do collage making. They bring old magazines and cut them up to make collages. And we have themes around you know, what to do with the collage. So you can see as an instructor, you can use activities that are relatively accessible to create things that are meaningful at the individual level, at the team level. As you can see, they sit with their teams so it can be a team building activity. And it also helps build community in the class as a whole. So at the end of an exercise, we might have a museum created with their artwork displayed. And then they're also the audience members of the museum where they write comments. So their critical thinking facilities and their critical experience comes out as they look and compare the different collages and leave comments for each other to say, oh, this is what I like, or this is what I see in this. So that it reveals something more to the creator with the consumer of the art giving feedback on what the art means to them, even though that may not have been their original intent in creating. So there's communication happening as well as part of that. And there's lessons around organizing because it suddenly makes it clear to them that museums are what we can create in our classroom, literally. If we can create art, we can create museums, we can create critical critics. Um, so there's layers and layers of lessons in soft skills and soft power that come through engaging with the art activity. And um, I've always had very positive feedback on many of these um, exercises that I've done. Another way that I've used this is um, in one of our programs, they move through the program as cohort. So they all know each other. Strategy class that I teach is at the end of the program. So I'm the new person in the room and they have all worked together. Uh, one of my colleagues mentioned to me that um, there was one particular cohort where there were a lot of interpersonal issues happening. And I realized that because even before the first day of class, I started getting emails because they see the syllabus and see, oh, there's teamwork required. And they said, oh, please don't put me on a team with so-and-so, or I don't want to work with so-and-so. And, -so. and I usually trust my students to self-organize. They're working adults. I don't want to be playing monitor and saying who works with whom. Really, that's the least favorite part of my job. Um, so what I did on the very first day of class, I showed up with these two paintings that I made and I held them up in two different hands and said, these are the same colors on the page differently. The class could be run one way or the other. Which one would you choose if we had to create the class norms or class culture? And 100% of the students in the class chose the mandala over the chaotic structure. And I didn't have to call it chaotic. I didn't have to say there's warfare going on or there's uh, you know, cliques and um, disturbances. I did not have to use any words at all to be judgmental because I can't have judgment. I need to give them a fresh start. I am meeting them for the very first time. The issues from before can easily be left behind rather than being named and worded and brought into the new space and the new water. And without naming it by just this visual thing, we were able to resolve and preempt many of the team issues that might have arisen because they voluntarily chose the mandala and they voluntarily came up with some rules of engagement of how they will treat each other and what will happen and how they will organize. And the teams were self-organized. It all worked out far better than it would have. So those are some sort of experiential examples of it. Let me give you an example from poetry. Most people shy away and say, I don't know anything about poetry. I don't really like poetry. It makes no sense to me. If you are from India, 
you've heard of the Ramayana. You have heard of the Mahabharat. These are two epic poems, literally poems because they're written in verse. It's like the Iliad and Odyssey that are more common in the West. Growing up in India, nobody in my extended circle of family or friends ever read these books but 100% of us were familiar with the characters and the plot and the main themes. Why is that? Because it's just in the air. You hear about it, you, the references, the characters are spoken of, um, some are worshipped, some stories are so commonly told as anecdotes um, that you just know without reading the epic poems. Um, and that's the power of art that more than 5,000 years after the story was orally transmitted, written down 5,000 years ago. And still to this day, 100% of the Indian population will be able to tell you the story of Ramayana or Mahabharat in broad brushstrokes. That's the longevity of art and the power of art, the stickiness. None of the management books ever written has 5,000 year lifespan. I can guarantee you that no matter how smart the professor and what school they came from. So um, I am the guest editor for a special issue of the Journal of Organizational Aesthetics on poetry for organizing. We're in the process of producing that. If you have a favorite song, uh, perhaps it's sung at special occasions, uh, perhaps it's the prayer from your school days, um, that's poetry too. Lyrics to songs are poetic. Um, so I am inspired by poetry because it gives me a way um, of accessing what can't be said in words and what's buried in between lines. And poetry is also interesting because it forces the reader to engage with the material. The same poem read at different times means different things, depending on your mood and what you focus on. So here's one that I like, which is um, a Hindi poem that I translated. And um, I'll read it to you. Uh, to repair a tear, you invented needle and thread, a bicycle to advance the walk, a plane to fly. You even brought rays of sunshine to light up the night and crossed the distance to the moon to link it with earth. Just like that, do rethink this world too. I loved the permission it gives to completely reinvent and builds confidence by saying how so many things humans have invented. So why not if the world feels broken on certain days, um, let's just reinvent the world. Um, recent times have been pretty dark. This is another poem from Hindi that I translated. The poet is Jitendra Srivastav and the poem goes, I can't see anything in the dark, no house, no tree, no ditch, no stone, no cloud, no soil, no bird or insect, not even your hand is visible in the dark. Yet, amazingly, the world's most beautiful dreams are always seen only when it's dark. And that has such a sense of hopefulness to it. Uh, that um, even at the darkest time, it brought this uh, common experience of dreams and um, lifted my spirits when I read it. So that's one of the reasons. In the leadership literature, there's a French lady by the name of Valerie Guthrie, who's created an entire field, subfield of leadership on how translating poetry is a form of savoir relayer, which is a way of engaging with the world to um, demonstrate your leadership skill. And as I started reading poetry at, in classrooms, in academic things, uh, conferences, I noticed more and more people confessed that they were writing poetry. 
So most of you are probably familiar with Professor Jim March, who's one of the best known scholars ever. He was at Stanford University and passed away last year. I didn't know till two years ago that he had published 11 books of poetry. Um, Atul Bihari Vajpayee, a former uh, prime minister in India, Jimmy Carter, the president of the US were also poets. So poetry has been very, very relevant and useful to leaders. So, um, and Jim March even wrote a paper in the Journal of Management Inquiry back in 2006, talking about how the managerial rhetoric that we have overly simplifies reality and it erases all the contradictions and uncertainty. But by using poetry, we can deal with the things that management is about, which is about doubt, about paradox, about contradiction, and then get to some real insight through poetry for that. So there's a whole literature on using poetry in management. If any of you are interested, please do email me and I will be happy to connect you with that. I haven't put a lot of citations in the interest of keeping this interactive, but the, the material exists. So uh, I'm mindful of the time and I do want to leave time for us to have Q and A. So I'm gonna skip over the improv bit. Um, it is theater exercises where we make up physical games and play together. There's Professor Ashish Pandey at one of the workshops at the Academy of Management and professors having fun playing improv theater games uh, where um, you, know, you can understand power dynamics. I don't have to tell you anything if you look at this visual image to know who has the higher status, who has the lower status. And in doing theater games that are quick and impromptu, a lot of stories come up, a lot of emotion comes up, a lot of things that would not be spoken of get enacted and um, new insights come from that. So I will stop there and show you a short video clip about my journey so far and um, the many, many people who have helped me with that while you prepare your questions for me and take this interactive. Be professional. Usually that means do not bring emotions or personal life to work. What if we were to show up as fully human at work? A few years ago, I heard the CEO of a global pharma company chant a long Sanskrit prayer to a packed audience of American management professors. I wondered what Sanskrit chanting had to do with mindful business. He told a personal tale about how his spiritual practice guided him through some tough business decisions and how he came to be so public about what he had previously guarded as his private practice. I turned to the arts for reconnecting with my spirit, poetry, improv, music, paintings, etc. What if I brought these to my professional life? Fast forward four years and I have offered several contemplative and experiential art workshops at professional conferences with and for business professors and students encouraged by the feedback and success. I was surprised when my first proposal for an experiential improv workshop passed the competitive peer review process. 
the attendees were surprised that instead of the usual presentation on how to use improv, they were guided to play together. We all were surprised pleasantly at the way many untold stories spilled out in our play with a lot of emotion connecting us as community, even though we had started the hour as a room full of strangers. In the closing circle, one professor said, laughter has no accent. Another, a distinguished professor whose work I had admired since I was a student said, you're so brave to offer this. I wrote academic articles about improv, but practicing it is the best way to demonstrate its power. This work has taken on a life of its own. I met colleagues who did inspiring work before me to pave the way for me to do this and others who are inspired by my work. Nancy lived a dual life as a management professor and an artist, hiding one side from the other. Steve nurtured a community that supported the use of arts in management. Vasanthi was inspired by our contemplative arts salon to return to her love of dance and create a training program for 500 women leaders for a large pharma company using a dance concert. The time seems right for bringing our humanity to all that we do. Being human is being a good professional. Let the arts connect and gently provoke us towards humanizing business management. Sushman Aryan, if there were any questions in the chat or comments that I need to address, you can voice them into the room or the floor is open. Okay, so uh, thanks very much, uh, Jyoti, for this wonderful presentation and your commitment for this field because, ladies and gentlemen, this is, I think, about 4, 4.15, 4.30 there in California AM. So. Yeah, so this timing was chosen uh, with the looking at the convenience of the Asian, Indian, and Filipinos and the Asian audience. So uh, thanks very much, Jyoti, for making yourself available at so inconvenient time. Uh, mean, uh, mean, uh, the, you can uh, all the participants are requested. You can type your questions in the chat box. Uh, but before that. Uh, there is one uh, concern was raised and uh, I thought I can bring it up for your thoughts uh, and your reflection about the issue. The, the concern was uh, raised, concern or question you can say, was uh, raised by Patch Ore, if I'm pronouncing his or her name correctly. Uh, she says that uh, agree it is like Mona Lisa fusion, though I remember some people being sensitive with this kind of work. I think some could label this as cultural appropriation. Admittedly, I'm a bit confused by what cultural appropriation means. Uh, personally, I'm fine and captivated by this, but some are offended by nevertheless. So I think it is work of art. So uh, this issue of the cultural appropriation and, the, and, and some people have also started calling it digestion. Uh, how do you see this and uh, what can be the stance of a, of a fairly neutral professor academic interested in humanistic management? That's a big question. I'll have to think about it. Um, I know that exactly like your experience of the Bunny Tani Mona Lisa, there are things that I encounter that offend me. And then there are things that don't offend me. And it's very unique. I take that as information about myself. 
um, and how I want to engage with the world. Um, I'll give you two examples. It's easier for me to talk about specifics than general generalities. So I was living in London. There is this store called East that sells very high end things that are made in India, like Rajasthani designs and, you know, cotton fabric um, and Kashmir fabric coats and dresses. Um, and in India, they wear salwar kameez, the pants and the top. In London, there were people who would just buy the top and wear it as a dress. And the slits on the side were considered like sexy slits in a dress. To me, that was offensive because the pants and the shirt go together in my mind. If you're wearing just the top and not wearing pants, you're half dressed. So for me, it was like, wear it properly if you're wearing it. Um, but, you know, I was in India for the Fulbright. And for the first time, I saw a lady dressed in a sari, the traditional Indian garment. And then she had a jacket on top, which is a very Western short jacket, like a business suit jacket. And to me, it was like, oh, jacket doesn't go with the sari. But it did because she looked brilliant in it. And that was okay with me that she took a Western garment and wore it with her Indian garment. But the other way around was not so okay with me because it felt it was, you know, I'm more modest and not being able to wear the bottom with the top and turning a kurta into a dress um, didn't feel right. So it's awareness of what works for you, what doesn't, and a way of having dialogue. If my friend did that, I would certainly confront my friend and tell her to put the pants on. But if I see a stranger on the street doing it, I'm not gonna go tell the stranger to put pants on with that. I'm just gonna shrug my shoulders and you know, shake my head at cultural appropriation and say, oh, I wish they knew better. So, those are my two examples. I hope that answers my position on it or clarifies or doesn't yeah. <laughs> to the question. If you have any question, any of you in the audience, please raise your hand or just speak out, unmute yourself and speak out. Hello. Yes, hi, Chris. Hi, good evening. Please good go ahead, Chris. Yes. Um, my name is Chris. I'm currently a Doctor of Business Administration student in the Philippines and De La Salle University. So my question is about management being treated as a both science and an art. So we always hear those terms that management is both science and an art. And then looking at the previous literature, we've heard it from Mary Parker Poley, Harold Koons, and several other authors about say, saying that you know management is an art of getting things done through people, while the famous father of scientific management, which is Frederick Taylor, right, mentioned that it's a science. So looking after the education of how the management is being taught, at least in my own observation in the Philippines, most of the time, we are exposed on the scientific basis of management. So my question is, how do you think the education system, you know, should evolve in terms of how management is being taught so that the science, uh, sorry, the, the art aspect of it can be further highlighted. Good question, Chris. And my position on this is very clear and that's why I'm part of the International Humanistic Management Association. Um, you know with great clarity what you profess. And when you know that, then you're ready to be a professor. And professors are by and large individual contributors who are experts in their field. And the last thing you want to do is tell another professor how to do their job and what they should be doing. So there's room for scientific basis of management and an artistic appreciation of management. I spent my early career building simulation models because that came easily to me. Maybe I was bored with it. Maybe I was frustrated that in this day and age when people are doubting climate change and I'm saying it's climate crisis. 
We did not see sun for three days in California because the fires completely blocked out the sun and it was raining ash. To me, if I don't have air to breathe, that's a climate crisis, not just climate change. I want to change things urgently. And if I want to change things urgently, I'll use whatever means available. And I will run with what matters to me. And saying we will reduce pollution by 30% by 2030 doesn't cut it for me. It's still ugly, it's less ugly. Can we just create something beautiful instead? Where is our imagination? So that's where I am at this stage of my career. And um, so to, I hope that answers your question. There's room for both and we all do what we feel most committed to. And it's okay to change sides as I do. <laughs> Thank you. Great. So we have two more questions and depending on your conveniences, I'll leave to Jyoti to take one or two. Uh, first, I'll, I'll go by the sequence, whosoever has typed the question first. So Angela typed first that, uh, how do you create atmosphere for a class that teaches management so you can introduce art and so students will be receptive to it? I expect students might be skeptical initially that it has anything to do with management. It makes people vulnerable and uh, they need to feel safe in sharing a part of themselves. So how do you create that atmosphere? Um one step at a time, baby steps, always respecting people's boundaries and asking for permission. So with the improv work, um, I started with a minute of silence in the class. And I asked, is this okay? And so many of them said, thank you, we really needed that. It helps us to fully arrive in class and let go of everything else that had been happening during the day and be physically, mentally, emotionally present in class. So we worked up from there to say, okay, if one minute of silence works, can we try another exercise? And I would do a check-in to say, how are you today? But they were not allowed to use words. They were only allowed to use a sound or a gesture. So very quickly, the entire class, sound and gesture takes a second and somebody would say, I'm sleepy. Somebody would rub their belly to say they're hungry. Somebody would go, yay, and somebody would look really tired. Very quickly, we had the temperature of the room and it was non-threatening. It was simple and it quickly allowed us to bond. Um, and they said they enjoyed it. So we built the next exercise, the next class. So it, it's an incremental process. If it's not comfortable, I back off. This is, I don't have to ram it down people's throats in any way. I'm passionate about it, but they have to find their passion. My job as a facilitator is to hold space for what emerges as a co-creative experience. Great, thank you very much. I think Jyoti, you have written something, uh, article, or I think you were writing a book as well uh, uh, on uh, using some of these pedagogical techniques uh, for the registered audience, or particularly who have attended this webinar. Probably, you would like to share some some part of it. If you email to us, we will ensure that it is it reaches to all of the participants. I can certainly do that. I had mentioned that I will share some resources. So let me do that really quickly. Um, so the student feedback of what I did, I was very scared to do this stuff and student feedback was positive, awards were offered. So it worked out and I got braver as I did it. And I've taken it to conferences at the Academy of Management, Western Academy of Management, the Indian Academy of Management, the Humanistic Management Associations conferences. So it, the work has traveled and been well received. Um, there are um, many resources on the website. If you look under activities, there are many events. 
There's also many, many videos like this one will be recorded and shared there. And there are many different country organizations. There is a journal, you can read the journal and publish in it. We are very keen to publish work from new scholars, particularly from Southeast Asia with fresh ideas that we don't see so much of in the Western dominated. There is a whole bunch of books written. Um, Michael Pearson's website is a good one to go find a whole lot of them. But as I said at the beginning, there's much more work done than is available on the website. So reach out to anybody whose name you see in the country organizations, in the videos and other places, and we will connect you. And there's also regular series. So um, Ashish mentioned my book, uh, Michael and I edited to, um, two volumes with case studies and exercises in which um, these, this work can be taught. I'll share the link to this video clip in the chat window and you can save that to say uh, what you know, humanistic management is. But there's also um, a PhD network that you can get involved with. There's necessary conversations that happen. There's a community connect. There are many, many activities and many different ways of getting involved, volunteering with us, helping build the India or the Filipino chapter by you know, hosting talks, inviting others who are doing these things. Uh, many great ways to get involved. So thank you. Um, let me just end with a short poem. Uh, I'll just read a short excerpt of it. It's for, by uh, Shubham Sri from Delhi, from Jawaharlal Nehru University. And they imagine if poetry was allowed in management schools and became the dominant thing in the world, what it would be. And the whole poem goes on about the difference between MBAs and poetry officers and poetry institutes and you know, America's capitalistic things around um, that compared to Iran's poetic tradition and other things. Assume, and part of the poem is this evening new, what evening news would look like if poetry was important. This is All India Radio. Now you'll hear the news in Hindi from Seema Anand. Namaskar. Today, the prime minister departs for a three-day international poetry conference. All the country's poetry groups are participating. The foreign minister made it clear that India will not change its poetry policy at any price. The India-Pakistan poetry negotiations were again unsuccessful. Pakistan demands India retract its claim on Iqbal, Manto, and Fez. China again tested new poetic adornments. Sources say that adornments will now create the most powerful poetry collection in the world. India's foremost poetry producer, Mr. Wandering Lover, Ashik Awara, died at dawn today. More attacks on Dalit poets in Uttar Pradesh. In the meantime, in games for the third time running, India has won the gold medal in Antakshari. India won the match in straight sets, 6-5, 6-4, 7-2. That's the news for today. Okay. So thanks very much, uh, uh, Jyoti, for this wonderful session. Uh, yeah, this is the greetings and gratitude. All of you can switch on the video for a minute. We can take a screenshot. Make this gesture, switch on your videos, and we'll make this screenshot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very everybody for your time and attention. Please reach out and connect. And I look forward you, to seeing Madam. your work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you so much.